May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. This is a special Shabbat. We continue our celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles today. Now this feast has several other names. It is called in the Hebrew Sukkot, or more accurately Chag HaSukkot, which is the, the Feast of Booths. It's also known as the Feast of Ingathering. It is first and foremost a harvest holiday. A harvest holiday. Ancient Israel was an agrarian culture, and so a lot of the things that, that they did were based around agriculture. Um, so this is uh, a harvest holiday. It was, in fact, the second harvest holiday. Uh, some might actually say it's even the third harvest holiday if you count Passover, but Passover had additional meaning to it too. The first one we really talk about as being a harvest festival is the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, or what we call Pentecost. Uh, it is the time when all of the spring uh, crops were gathered in and harvested. Uh, and then they planted again, and all of the, uh, the, the summer harvest uh, gets gathered in at Sukkot, or the Feast of Booths. The Torah portion is a special portion specifically designed for today. Uh, we call this Shabbat, Shabbat Chol HaMoed Sukkot, uh, which basically is the Sabbath in the middle of the, the appointment of booths. Okay. It's a long name, but that's what it is. See, Booths is a seven-day holiday lasting for eight days. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. It means you guys are listening. Um, and because it's a seven-day festival that lasts for there's always a seven-day Shabbat, seventh-day Shabbat in the middle of it. That is Shabbat Chol HaMoed Sukkot, and that's what we, uh, we are celebrating today. And rather than reading um, in the traditional cycle in the Torah, um, which in this case would be the very final portion from the book of Deuteronomy, which is the final book of the Torah, um, the portion named uh, Vizot HaBracha, um, rather than reading that, we're reading a special portion designed just for, uh, just for today. It uh, comes not from Deuteronomy, but rather, as we said earlier, from Exodus. And it begins in chapter 33, verse 12. Moses, as we pick up the story, is having a passionate conversation with the Lord. Okay? At its core, this conversation is about Moses' desire to have a personal relationship with God. Now, it doesn't exactly say that in the passage, but really... When you look at it, that's what he's looking for. He wants to know God on a personal level. He wants God to reveal himself to him at a very personal level. That's what the nitty gritty of this conversation is about. Um, he makes a progressive argument for God revealing his glory to him. He says, first, you said, you said that I found favor in your sight. Now, if that's really true, then I should know you, don't you think? And if, if, and if I should know you, that means you have to reveal yourself to me. So show me your ways. Note, it's really interesting. The first thing that, that Moses says to God in terms of having the Lord um, reveal himself so that he could know him was show me your ways. The first thing is not show me your face. It's not... Um, you know, anything else other than show me your ways. And that's, what, that's how God revealed himself. So that's what Moses asked for. Second, he says, remember, these people are your people. They're not my people. You called them Abraham out of Ur. You did all these things. You created this people. They're your people. They're not my people. And shouldn't they know you too? So he starts with a personal thing. I have found favor in your sight. You said so yourself, so I should know you. And all these people here, you have said that they're your people. They already know me, but they should know you too. God tells Moses, hey, you know what? And this is a paraphrase. <laughs> hey, you know what? 
You're absolutely right. So therefore, my presence is going to go with you. Now, you can almost hear Moses' response, you know, being, um, you know, of the Jewish ilk. He was probably more than a little sarcastic. So he says, oh, your presence is going, you're absolutely right your presence is going with me. In fact, if your presence doesn't go with us, we ain't going anywhere. We're going to sit right here. So you're absolutely right your presence is going with us. Hear that? I mean, that's essentially what he says. He says, in fact, if you're not going, we're not going. Because if you don't go with us, if you don't go with us, catch this, if you don't go with us, how are we any different from any other people in this world? You see, in the ancient culture, everybody had a little God. Some of them were, were little enough, you just stick them in your pocket, and the, it went with you. Everywhere you went, you took it with you. In fact, back in Genesis, when we read about um, you know, Rachel uh, leaving Laban's house, she takes all these little gods with her because she wants God to go with them. So she takes all these idols with them so that God would go with us. But they're just little idols. In this case, if God himself does not go with the people, then the people walking around saying, our God goes with us, our God goes with us, is no different from any other people group around at the time. What would make them different is only if truly the Lord God's presence went with them. And so Moses says to God, if you don't go with us, how are we different from any other nation in the world that claims their God is with them? And God acknowledges this. And he says, I will go with you. Now Moses must have been feeling pretty bold at that moment. Because then he says, now, show me your glory. It's all, I mean, it's kind of like, remember when Abraham had that, that, that back and forth with the God over Saddam and Amorah? He said, Lord, what if there are 50 people, 50 righteous people in the city? And the Lord says, well, okay, if there are 50 righteous people in the city, I won't destroy it. Oh, I didn't think that was going to work. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try that one again. Oh, Lord, what if, and, and he continues on until they're, they're, you know, they agree that if there are 10 righteous people in the city, they wouldn't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Turns out only Lot and his family, and so Sodom and Gomorrah gets destroyed. But that's sort of like what I, what I see with Moses here. You know, Moses is, is you know, talking to God, and he's sort of getting the, the responses he wants. And so he gets bold. He says, now, show me your glory. God says, I really wish I could, but I can't. Because nobody can see my glory and live. And so what does God do? He does the next best thing. He says, I will let all of my goodness pass before you. I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and when I walk by, I will cover your eyes so that you do not see my glory and die, but you'll see the rest of me walking by. Where does this all stem from, though? This whole conversation, where does it come from? Let's remember where we are in the history of Israel. Israel had been slaves in Egypt. They were delivered out by the hand of God, the strong arm of the Lord. They are now on the other side of the, the, the sea, camped at the base of Mount Sinai, and Moses goes up the mountain, cautioning them first, hey, I'll be back. Goes up the mountain, and apparently the children of Israel were expecting him a little sooner. Because they like the other nations wanted to have their God with them. But they didn't know any better. Well, they did know better. But what they were used to, their habit, 
was to have an idol, something carved. Remember, they had just come out of Egypt. So what did they do? They create the golden calf. And you remember how they fashioned it, right? Well, if you believe Aaron, they threw all this gold into the fire and boop, out came a calf. Right? So they had just finished going through this whole episode with the calf and, and then, you know, Moses says, you know, comes down and says, what are you doing? Probably with that accent. And he takes, what are you doing? And he takes the two tablets that God had written on and he smashes them to the ground. Right after that, God tells them, all right, I see how y'all are. Get up and go. Go on, get up and go. But I'm not going with you. If you want to be like that, y'all are on your own. He says, additionally, and this is probably very, very true. Well, God said it, so it's absolutely true. He says, I'm not going to go with you because if I were to go with you, eventually I'm going to have to kill you. So you really don't want me with you. So just get up, get up and go. That's why we read in our portion this morning that Moses had to intercede. The selected reading this morning follows the conversation that God had with Moses. God had made a 